Hello, and welcome back to Blogging Heads Nation. I'm Heather Hurlbert from the National Security Network. And I'm uh, Eric Posner. I teach at the University of Chicago Law School. And today we bring you the uh, multilateral Northern European edition, um, <laughs> starting in Copenhagen and ranging to Oslo with a brief side trip to Kabul and environs. So, um, Eric, global climate change, are you inside with the negotiators or outside on the street with the protesters? Uh, I'm, uh, I, uh, gosh, that's a hard way. I'm sort of in between, I, I guess. Um, uh, I, well, I, I support the negotiators. I, I hope they succeed in, in producing a, uh, a good uh, treaty, but I'm, I'm very pessimistic about whether they can actually accomplish that. How about you? Which side of the wall are you on? <laughs> No, I'm 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 also inside looking out. Um, what what constitutes a good or sufficient accomplishment in your view? Well, I think a, a treaty w- would be a good accomplishment. I, I guess that's just not going to happen. Uh, they've been talking instead of uh, some kind of political uh, agreement. Um, so I, I don't even know where to where to begin. Uh, may, maybe with all of the all of the problems, the uh, there are a bunch of divides. Uh, the north south divide uh, between rich and poor countries seems like a, a big a big problem. The uh, the divide between um, which is slightly related between the big developing economies and uh, the West is a big problem. The big developing economies don't seem to want to accept uh, limits. And then finally, this thing which surfaced recently, which is the issue about monitoring. I don't know whether that's a real issue or whether it's just posturing, but um, if countries like China don't accept uh, significant monitoring, then uh, it's hard to imagine how a treaty could be successful. Yeah, I was going to actually frame the the divides a, a little differently in that you've had, especially in the last month, a lot of progress with both India and China being um, willing to announce um, limits or targets that they'll that they'll live up to, and, and the, the the real problem seems first to be this verification point, um, and then second that both China and India are really torn between their role as major emitters and major economic powers, who are constantly being invited by the developed countries to take a seat at the table, and their sort of historic role as leaders. Of the developing world and the, what 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 used to be known as the non-aligned movement, um, so you you sort of see. I mean, the, the, to me, one of the the fascinating things about the politics of this is that you actually really only need about seventeen countries to come to agreement. Um, that you could you could cut emissions enough to to hit the two degree warming target with seventeen countries that include basically the large developed economies plus. China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, Mexico, and South Africa. So, you know, what? Um, there was a wonderful line at UN Dispatch characterizing the negotiations as a game of chicken with 192 participants. Right. Yes, I saw that. Yes. Um, and in fact, uh, all you need is for these 17 to, to agree targets and actually stick to them. But then you have the developing world, which, of course, is the most affected and and therefore is is has you know, sort of a whole different set of aims in the negotiations being compensation and help with that, with adaptation to to you know the the changes that will take place even with with just two degrees of warming, and that you know of course is a political problem for the U.S. and others. And then second, you have and I it looks to me like most of the mess that's gone on this week relates to just how much the developing countries don't like the sense that they're being left out and the sense that the final agreement will be hammered out among, you know, a dozen or two dozen or three dozen, but not 192 heads of state over the next couple of days, um, and sort of the effort to, to protest that as, as, much as, as much as possible. But if you really think of, think of this as, as kind of a wheel within a wheel, and one wheel is, is 17 or 20 or 25 countries, and the other is 192 countries, that, that gives you a somewhat better, I think, feel for what's going on. Yeah, and, and I guess more grounds for optimism. I mean, it does suggest that the developing countries, and, and when we say developing countries, I, I guess we're excluding China and so forth, um, the poorer developing countries just have to be left out. And what I found, uh, you know, it's a little odd, is that they're demanding all of this money. I think 100 to $200 billion a, a year, that was a, an estimate that came from uh, the UN, I think, uh, which uh, reflects how much it would cost for them to adapt uh, to climate change. 
and uh, they don't have any bargaining power. Uh, they don't because they don't have much in the way of industry, except um, for two things, I guess. Some of these countries have lots of forests that they could destroy. And the other thing is that uh, since this is really the long term we're talking about, not the short term, it's certainly possible that these countries in the future could be could develop the way India and China have and, and become a, a problem at, at that point. But I suppose for the time being, uh, you agree about this then, that it is uh, a grounds for optimism that all of these poor countries can be ignored. Well, um, actually, the way I would put it is that the first piece of really concrete good news coming out of the talks is that we it looks like they have actually gotten to agreement on a forestry piece, which is good news. Well, it's, it's good news for the planet because, every, as everybody knows, forests are one of the most important carbon sinks. Um, it's good news for the developing countries because they're where most of the really crucial forests and particularly the rainforests are. Um, and it's good news for developed countries and developed country industries because the money that goes to support forests in developing countries is also used as an, as an offset so that basically um, some of what, say, the U.S. or Britain or Italy or Spain or France pledges as reductions counts as saving forests in the Amazon or in the, um, the tropical forest band of Africa. Say so. So that is a huge, um, a huge deal. That it looks as if most of the, most of the work has actually gotten done. And um, you know, ironically, it won't be announced until the heads of state get to Copenhagen because it may be the centerpiece of of what, what comes out. I mean, and going back to the treaty question a bit, you know, we should, we should just be honest and and say that the the primary obstacle to you know the the thing that made it clear there was going to be no treaty coming out of this is the fact that the U.S. was unable to pass a bill this year and was unable to, to name a target until um, just in the last month, and that even then, of course, everybody who's, who follows U.S. politics is well aware that um, the president proposes and Congress disposes. So, so you know, people know that A, our target is modest, and B, um, it's not the last word on the subject. And as long as the U.S. was making it clear that we couldn't commit to a legally binding target, there's no reason in the world for anybody else to commit to one. And the, the thing that you saw... It was interesting was that, you know, the, the thing was in complete disarray when the U.S. had not committed to any target. And then when, when the president did come out and announce our target, um, what is it, three, four weeks ago now, um, China announced its target the next day, and India announced its target the next week. So, you know, the good news here is that the U.S. still has some sway, and people who say the U.S. no longer has any influence over things are, are wrong. The bad news is that it was late and it wasn't legally binding and it wasn't enough sway to, to move us toward a treaty. So Well, and, and the worst news, though, is that it seems, it doesn't seem likely that the U.S. will ever commit to reducing emissions by the amount that would be necessary to actually address the problem. And so even if you believe these other countries, and I, I'm a little more skeptical uh, about whether they're going to follow through with their obligations, that they, that won't be enough uh, enough as well. So and and then even uh, I mean what you say is exactly right, but it's it's a huge problem. Uh, it's not it's not just a question of whether the U.S. has influence. It's simply a question whether the United States is willing to um, uh, commit to uh, a reasonable uh, a, a reasonable uh, uh, target, and and it, and it can't. There, there's no reason for other countries to think that the United States uh, can can or will. Well, I think the optimistic way of looking at that is that the plan that was presented is a low target initially that ramps up over time and that you start with what's politically feasible now and you sort of um, assume that, A, the economy will get better and, B, that we'll start to see the benefits of doing what we're doing and that we will start to actually build a green economy that it's clear to everyone creates jobs and so on and that then it'll actually get easier rather than more difficult down the road. And as I'm, as I'm saying that, I'm, I'm sure I don't look entirely convinced by my own rhetoric. You <laughs> no, you don't see. look that way, and I can't even see you. <laughs> but, but look, I mean, you know, there's not, it's not clear to me that there's a better option. And I know, I, I know since you and I aren't fighting enough with each other, I will, I will now bravely engage okay. in, a straw, in a straw man fight with the viewership. <laughs> you right. know, I know, I know there's a lot of anger that, um, that the targets aren't more ambitious, 
But given that we are where we are politically, it, it does seem to me that the only thing, you know, the only thing for all of us who, who have kids and would like them to know what snow looks like occasionally, although I could understand that you sitting in Chicago might have a different view on that. Yeah, they can um, rely on their know. memories indefinitely as far as I'm concerned. Um, <laughs> yeah, two degrees two degrees <laughs> seems different in Chicago. Um, yeah. That, you know, that we, we're, just, we're going to have to make this work and that everybody is, is going to have to really commit ourselves to that because, as you I mean, I'm, I'm with you in saying that I don't know I don't know what else you could you could get out of our poli- political system. Let me actually ask you a question Eric that um that taps your legal expertise a little bit. There's a there's a segment of the environmental movement that's very keen on the US um executive branch making higher commitments in a legally binding international agreement and then presenting it back to the US not as a treaty but as an executive agreement and therefore sidestepping the two-thirds ratification provision of the constitution. <laughs> Push on steroids. Yes, I it like will, that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I have said to people that I'm um, as as opposed to global warming as the next person. But if you take out Obama and climate and replace it with Bush and Iraq, um, you would be really troubled by that kind of procedure. And that we just as we have a long term climate stewardship obligation, we also have a long term constitution stewardship obligation. Yeah. Well, you know the. the uh, as, as I think we know from our last discussion, I, I'm less troubled by, uh, you know, these the strong executive powers. So while, you know, I, I'm happy to, to see Obama do something like that, I, I don't think it would succeed. Um, there, are, there are, you know, there are a number of possibilities. One is, yes, he could just make an executive agreement, and um, he'd have to search somewhere in either statutory law or constitutional law for authority. Of course, presidents can make executive agreements. The question is, whether he would have authority in this case, and there's really it would really be uh, pretty dubious. But there's an alternative, which is um, what's called a congressional executive agreement, where um, instead of uh, getting two thirds of the Senate for a treaty, you get a majority of both houses for essentially a kind of a parallel statute. You know, it's like we just we just we enter into a kind of political uh, climate agreement. And then Obama goes to Congress and says, well, let's pass a statute that simply embodies whatever our obligations are, our political obligations are under the treaty. There's a lot of precedent for that. In fact, that's the way our trade treaties work. Um, We don't use the uh, two-thirds Senate approach. We use a majority in each house. And and it's easier to get a majority in each house than to get two-thirds in the Senate for for lots of reasons. So there might be be something like that uh, down the road. And, you know, I, I think that would be great because... I think I trust the executive branch more than I trust Congress to uh, to do the right thing uh, in this sort of situation. Speaking of which, though, I mean, maybe why shouldn't we blame Obama uh, for not uh, being more aggressive about climate change? Maybe, for example, he should have uh, made climate change a priority rather than health care. It seems to me you could make a, a plausible argument, certainly from a global perspective, that climate change is a far more pressing problem than the inefficient uh, health care system in the United States. I think you certainly could make that argument from a global perspective, but, of course, presidents aren't elected by the globe. Yeah, so, they, they get Nobel Prizes from the globe, or maybe just from the Norwegians. Yes, I, I guess yeah. that's different. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, my, you know, I, there definitely was this debate, and I certainly still have a lot of understanding for the feeling that if you could get well, two things. One is if you could get the big win on health care, that would make more things easier than getting the big win on climate. Um, because, you know, climate, if he were, you know, supposing in your sort of, I think the best case scenario is that the 17% number, you know, we would have House and Senate bills passed. But the number wouldn't be any higher than 17%. So, you know, you'd be in Copenhagen and in some you, ways... You say 17%, you mean the 17% reduction from 2005 yeah, yes. uh, emissions yes. levels. Sorry. Right. So, well, I, I knew, but you know, maybe maybe one of our viewers doesn't know. So. Thank you, yeah. and I apologize for being lazy about it. But um, so you you actually wouldn't be much; you'd be a little further along um, on the global scene, but we'd still I think we'd still be having a lot of the same arguments. And and frankly, it wouldn't. I just don't think it would have changed the politics of the domestic scene all that much. Um, where, you know, and I'm still not sort of not totally clear on how health care is going to come out, but I understand what the theory was in terms of if you actually put something through on health care, then 
you have a smoother sailing on the domestic side, which also spills over into greater trust of what you do on the international side. And, and the other point that I think, you know, in fairness, we have to keep making is that it remains the case, even after Iraq, that the, most of the people who control the flow of ideas and enthusiasm in the Democratic Party are there for domestic reasons rather than international reasons. Um, much to my much to my sorrow and despair, but um, but the stuff that really gets people's juices flowing, that gets the party motivated, is first and foremost the domestic stuff. And so I think ultimately that's why that's why healthcare won. Okay, well let me. Uh, I want to go back to another point you made, which is that uh, maybe a short term agreement of some sort would lead to uh, you know, um, which is inadequate, would at least lay the groundwork for uh, commitments in the long term. But another way of looking at it is is just that they they can't really agree on on substan and substantial commitments. So what they do is they agree on um, insufficient uh, limitations, and then they just kick it down the road. Where it seems to me we could expect uh, nothing to happen, and the and the reason is that so you mentioned the screen jobs thing uh, th- stuff, and I, I'm not. You know, people say this a lot, but but that's just a way of saying that the cost is not going to be as enormous as it w- otherwise would be. So what people will realize down the road is that the cost of energy is going up. Now, it wouldn't go up as much as it would if some substitutes weren't found, but it's still going to go up, and it's going to hurt. And, uh, you know, the benefits will actually be invisible since the benefits from reducing emissions are all felt in the future, you know, and maybe even in the future, we won't really be able to tell very well, right? So in the year 2050 or 2060, it'll be slightly cooler than it would be otherwise. Well, you know, on average, nobody's going to really notice that. So it seems to me that as time passes, there's actually going to be a lot of pressure to break uh, treaty commitments. And in a lot of countries, uh, unlike the West, are never very, you know, are not really very good at keeping their treaty commitments in the first place. So so I think uh, I'm, I'm pe- this is what makes me a pessimist rather than an optimist about these climate negotiations. Yeah. Well, I think um, the, the place that I disagree with you is that if you sort of the, the interesting thing is the public so far climate and energy are two somewhat different buckets in people's minds, and so I don't think the future you've sketched out is inevitable if. It's clear that energy prices, I mean, energy prices are going up because the stuff is getting more scarce and more people are using more of it. And therefore, even if you don't believe in global warming or don't notice it, you're going to need um, diversified energy sources. So as long as, I mean, I think there's a, there's a fighting chance to explain what people see with energy prices as a relationship to supply, and therefore you have to diversify supply. And it also happens that you're going to diversify supply in ways that are going to be better for the planet. Um, second, it's not clear to me, you know, we're, we're terrible as a society in, in looking at the real costs of anything. Um, and the health the healthcare debate shows this as well, by the way, um, that we it's, it's an absolute disaster. And so I think, and again, this is, you know, this is a big burden on the people who, who support certain policies, but... Um, it's just not necessarily the case that people are going to perceive uh, global warming treaty mandated changes as enormous um, enormous taxes on there. You know, for example, who remembers now that gas was cheaper when it had lead in it? Um, that gas actually, you know, the price of gas went up when we took lead out of gas to keep kids from getting having um, birth defects and, and developmental disabilities. Um, Remember you know, we, what, what happened just a couple of years ago when there was the big st- uh, spike in oil prices? All of the, you know, all the state uh, legislatures suspended the gasoline tax. Mm-hmm. That, that's the real concern, that just as energy prices go up, um, whether people understand that it's from the, a treaty obligation or whether it's from something else, um, uh, there, there'll be a lot of pressure on the governments to, to step in and, and sub, you know, subsidize indirectly or directly mm-hmm. the consumption of, of energy. Yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't disagree with that, but I don't think it's inevitable that what that does is roll back um, global warming commitments again, depending on on how it's managed. Okay, Heather, um, let me let, let me ask you uh, uh, something else that we we've skirted around. So, a lot of people in the Copenhagen negotiations make moral arguments. Um, now, now, obviously, there's a, there's a basic moral argument uh, that it's a good thing to help people 
and so therefore we should reduce emissions since the gains are, are, are higher than the cost. But they're more, uh, they're different types of uh, moral issues. One is that the rich countries owe uh, help to the poor countries uh, because, you know, poor people are less well off than wealthy people. Another is that uh, because the rich countries are responsible for the problem, they should, um, they should, uh, they should uh, pay more for, for the solution. That's, that's an independent uh, type of argument, but it, they're sort of consistent with each other. Now, now in the academic literature, I, I, I'm not really sure how important these arguments are in the public sphere, but in the academic literature, they're enormously important. They're pretty much the dominant view. Um, I haven't gotten a sense, and of course the developing countries say, you know, we, we, we deserve money, but do, do you think these arguments are important uh, politically? Are, are they going to have an effect on, on, on the outcome? Or are the uh, big countries just going to ignore the, the little countries except where they have to pay them off? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I have a personal moral view about it, but I also have a pragmatic view, which is that if we believe this is a priority, we need to, to do what it takes to get it solved. And if we believe that the costs of doing nothing are as enormous as they've been sketched out to be, then actually paying developing countries is a pretty good bargain. And so in my view, you have, you have a pragmatic argument for it uh, before you even get to the moral arguments. Um, second, you also, I think, have a pragmatic argument that if you allow, um, I mean, if, you, if you look at the troubles that Sudan is having, for example, that's in sustaining any kind of peace, and then you think about that in the context of the problem of desertification and increased struggles over decreasing resources of land and water. If you think about um, Bangladesh, um, and you think about Bangladesh already having too many people, not enough arable land, and then you think about Bangladesh losing land, and then you think about India building a fence to keep Bangladeshis out, um, and then you think about the, the, um, the costs to the U.S. of there being yet another regional war in South Asia. Um, then, you know, paying people, um, giving people money to make adaptations, giving people money to help ensure that, um, that they develop in ways that we don't have enormous new carbon sources in 25 or 50 years. Again, it starts to look like a really good, a really good practical investment. And then um, it's interesting because I actually was challenged re recently that um, – as a progressive, I wasn't doing enough talking about morality. So oh, yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm sort of, I'm, I'm thinking of the person who challenged me and saying, okay, here it goes. And, and I do, I mean, I do actually believe that we all have a moral, a, a really unpleasant and heavy weighing moral obligation to always look around. And if we have two coats and our neighbor has none, we need to give our neighbor one. So for me personally, it, it doesn't get any more complicated than that. But I don't think you actually have to go there in order to get good pragmatic arguments for for adaptation payments, well, it, it depends how you know. It depends. You you, you present the pragmatic arguments in a kind of uh, global uh, generic way, but they vary from country to country. So there are lots of poor countries that can be safely ignored, and there are other poor countries that pose security threats. And in the case of the poor countries that pose security threats, we, we want to you know we may want to invest resources in them. It's probably a better way. A better way to invest resources in them would be one would be a way that actually addresses the threat in particular, rather than trying to uh, you know reduce you know limit limit global uh, global warming. Um, the, the two things are are not they're not the same. So, for example, there might be just to be a little more concrete, there might be a country somewhere that simply isn't a threat to anybody. They're going right, to get Well, poor. you're saying who cares about Kiribati, right? Who cares if Kiribati <laughs> sinks under the water? That's kind of really what you're saying. Uh, yeah, that's 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 well. I guess what I'm saying is, um, is it a climate treaty issue or is it a independent issue that should be addressed uh, separately? Well, so again, so there's a first tier of countries whose resources are really important to slowing and reversing global warming. So countries with significant tropical or boreal forests or, or peat bogs, right? So that's category one, and that's not even adaptation. That's sort of preservation and enhancement. Right. That could include wealthy countries as well or, you know, middle-income yeah. countries. Yeah, so. I mean, Brazil yeah. is, a, Brazil right, is a, exactly. a great case where Brazil sort of sits on, sits on both sides, sides of the spectrum. Um, then you have a group of countries that have the potential to be significant emitters in future because they're significantly large. Uh, 
And it's clearly, you know, in order not to be in exactly the same situation in 75 or 100 years, it's clearly in everybody's interest um, to get them on the right technological path to, to not going through the kind of coal-fired, incredibly dirty industrialization that we went through and that now India and China are going through. And, by the way, um, if we sell or give them the technology, there's a, there's a side benefit of, of jobs and, and, um, and technological development there. So that's kind of a second category. And then there's a third category of countries that are too small that, you know, for example, Kiribati, again, sorry to pick on them, um, Tuvalu, are never going to be significant emitters. And although Pacific Ocean warfare buffs may disagree with me, they they have a fairly limited strategic significance. And so then, then there come a couple questions. There's a pure moral argument. And then second especially because the island nations have, have made themselves, have worked so hard to make themselves the, the poster child of the issue, there's a kind of demonstration case that says, is it worth, you know, do we need to save them just to demonstrate that there is, in fact, solidarity, and to, in order to get, say, Brazil and Congo to trust us, we need to save Kiribati and, and Tuvalu. And then I think that actually brings you to, to the thing that will that will help make this work, is that even if the U.S. feels that it needs to take care of its strategic interests first, and thus we need to focus on Bangladesh, um, Congo, and so on. You do have other developed countries which are both very interested in stopping climate change and very interested in promoting themselves as moral leaders. So I'm not sure that it has to be U.S. dollars that save Kiribati, but again, if the U.S. indicates that we will make sure you know, that say Congo isn't able to industrialize in a green manner and that we will think with India about how to help the Bangladeshis, then surely the Norwegians can take care of the Kiribati's, the Danish can take care of Tuvalu. I mean, you know, obviously it's not quite one for one like this, but it's a bit of a, you know, it's, it's just not the case that the U.S. has to make all these trade-offs by itself. Right, I, I agree, and I'm not, you know, I'm not sure how much we're disagreeing here. I'm making a, a pretty limited point that it's not clear to me that these are climate issues in the following sense: that there's a there's a big pool of money from the rich countries that will somehow be divided among, I should say, a medium-sized to small pool of money. I don't think they're really going to give much money to these countries. In fact, as you might have seen, that this report surfaced that the European <laughs> the European countries were actually planning to fund this um, this pool of money for the uh, poor countries by actually taking it out of their own foreign aid budgets. So they're actually not doing anything. Now, now I assume that was too embarrassing to sustain, but countries don't like giving money to other countries. And th- so there are, two, there are two points here. One is, what is the sort of level of uh, carbon emission reductions that are in the interest of, let's say, the United States in particular or France or, or whatever? And the second is, you know, what can we do for the rest of the world? And it may well turn out the case that the the emissions reductions that are optimal for us are actually lower than what they are for, uh, let's say, a low-lying island nation. And in, and the only point I want to make is that the climate treaty should should focus on the first. It'll be hard enough to get a reasonable a reasonable, um, a reasonable uh, uh, set of uh, emission reductions. And it's, I, I'm, I'm 99% sure that whatever is ultimately agreed upon is going to be much less than is scientifically appropriate. When you throw in all of these moral claims, you just make it much more difficult for these countries to uh, agree in the first place, and you make the whole process much more expensive, which means that uh, agreement is less likely or that the final agreement might be less ambitious in terms of uh, reduction of emissions and carbon. So, for example, if we're giving a, a huge amount of money to various countries, that's going to have to be on top of uh, the increased cost of, uh, of energy. And it's less likely that the public is going to go along than they would if we were just increasing the cost of energy and not helping out these other countries. So we started off with pessimism on my part and I guess a little bit of pessimism on your part about whether a climate treaty can be ac- accomplished. If that pessimism is justified, it seems to me we should go for the minimalist bare bones treaty rather than one that, you know, produces global justice in addition to uh, a mit- climate change mitigation. Well, th- I think the one counterpoint to that, of course, and the thing that is, you know, that makes game theory the wonderful field that it is and that makes sure that international negotiations keep keep you folks in academia fully employed, 
is that, of course, if you are if you are the government of Kiribati or Tuvalu or um, um, Mali or Mauritania, um, your your whole interest in the proceedings is ensuring that the scenario you just sketched out won't fly. Right, right. Um, and that their their desires and attempts to do that are every bit as legitimate as our desires and attempts to produce an agreement that will cause the U.S. Congress the least amount of heartburn. You know, that's what international negotiations right. are for. And, um, you know, I think, it's a, I think it's a mistake. You know, we end up where we end up. Um, but I think it's a mistake to start out by, you know, by sort of saying publicly that some people's aspirations for national survival are more legitimate than other people's <laughs> aspirations. And I, and I must say, you know, the... You know what you're what you're seeing now is that the developing countries have actually done a fairly good job of of slowing down the rush to the kind of treaty that you describe. And then the next uh-huh. question is, having yeah. done that, everybody has a moral as well as a practical obligation to come up with something else instead. And that's, I think, where we're stuck at the right. moment. Right. Well, but when you said that it really only really 17 countries agreed with, this is what I was thinking. When it, only 17 countries really matter. That's that's what you started with. I was thinking about this very point. If you're right, I think that's grand for optimism for us, you know, for the 17 countries. But these other countries are going to be unhappy. I also think that what's going to happen is there'll be a kind of a small payoff, very very small payoff to to the to the to the uh, to the the poor countries to try to assuage their their uh, you know their objections a little bit. But I, I don't think uh, it's going to be much more than that. Yeah, you you are certainly right that the size of the payoff will be disappointing. I I, I don't think I'm uh, I'm not breaking any code to say that. Right. Um, should we should yeah. we move our move our attention a little yes. bit a little bit further east? And um, you wanted to you wanted to talk about Afghanistan, right? Uh, well, so what did you think? I, I thought we could talk about both the the, the Nobel speech and the uh, the speech about Afghanistan, um, and. Uh, they're obviously connected, uh, and uh, well, why don't I? I'll just put my views on the table, and you, you can tell me where I, where I go wrong. So, th- I thought the Nobel speech was a bunch of uh, cliches, basically. Um, my my interpretation of it would be: uh, we sh- we shouldn't go to war unless uh, we really should. It's really in our interest to go and go to war. And I thought the Afghanistan speech was disappointing. I don't think he really, uh, in the end, provided a justification, a, a, a persuasive justification for staying in Afghanistan. Now, maybe it's impossible to do that. Maybe it's just, you know, it's just too subtle. There are these costs and there are these benefits, and I'm glad he, he mentioned costs and benefits. I thought that showed a certain uh, candor that other presidents don't like uh, showing. But, uh, but in the end, I couldn't, you know, I'm not an expert on Afghanistan, so just in my capacity as an ordinary citizen listening to this, I listened to it on the radio, I couldn't figure out what the, what the justification for. I could understand self-defense, meaning once uh, the 9-11 attacks occurred and the Afghanistan government refused to cooperate in, uh, in, uh, in, in handing over members of al-Qaeda, there was a, there was a pretty good uh, justification for launching an attack. Uh, that was eight years ago, and what's the justification now for staying? And you know, I, I couldn't figure it out. So, so what's what's your view about these speeches? So, Afghanistan speech first. Um, I think both its its strength and its weakness is actually something you put your finger on. Is an attempt to bring um, an extraordinary amount of subtlety to um, an issue that both you know we're dealing with with a very blunt instrument, which is war in the U.S. military. And second, um, to try to take that extraordinarily high level of, of subtlety out to the to, to then make a, a public case. And I think the the weakness is that the case for staying in that people in the administration would make to you in private has a lot more to do with Pakistan and has to do with both Pakistani nuclear weapons and concern about Al Qaeda getting hold of them, and also the stability of the Pakistani state and therefore the borderlands. And that since there's there are real limits on what we can do to influence the stability of the Pakistani state, or for that matter, the, the structure and, and activities of the Pakistani state from inside Pakistan, what we can do along the Afghan borderland it, it then sort of has an importance that it wouldn't have otherwise. And I think some of this the administration felt it didn't want to say in public because, of course, it's very offensive to the Pakistani government. 
Um, so I understand that up to a point. We were all very surprised that there wasn't more talk about Pakistan in the speech, that you know, it was even though um, anyone you'll talk to in or out of government will say, oh, Pakistan is at least as important as Afghanistan, if not more so, there was just, there wasn't really an attempt to explain that. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand the, the, that, that point. So what seems to be happening is that Pakistan is being destabilized by the war in Afghanistan. Pakistan seemed to be better off when the Taliban were, were, was in power. And now the Taliban is being driven uh, out of Afghanistan and into Pakistan, where it's sowing instability. So well, what's just the, for the record, yeah. when, the pa- when, pa- when the Taliban was in power in Afghanistan, the military government that was in power in Pakistan was busily selling nuclear technology to the North, North Koreans and anybody else who came calling. So, um, but I, the, the country I, wasn't an, about it, to collapse. That, it's that, an that, ugly choice between yeah. this Pakistani govern um, sort of this Pakistan and that Pakistan, but I, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to look the the Pakistani government that we had in the nineties. In many ways, sowed the seeds of, of what we're dealing with now. So I wouldn't. Um, that's not a. I, I don't think that's a useful trade off to to think about. Um, what I would say is that the, the combination of look, there, there, Pakistan had a, a military government before. Now it has a weak civilian government. You had a military situation that was always somewhat unsustainable in Pakistan before. Now you're faced with the challenge of actually getting a civilian system that has some staying power to it, which is you know a hard proposition under the best of scenarios. At the same time, you have a military insurgency which became able to operate on the borders of Pakistan and Afghanistan with impunity because the Bush administration quit paying attention to Afghanistan and pulled out all the special forces teams and sent them to to um, Iraq. Um, so there's a lot that of sort of past misdeeds that, that at the same time, by the way, as the, the administration's relationship with Pakistan was incredibly personalized through Musharraf, and Musharraf basically got a lot of blank checks which were cashed by the Pakistani military to go after India and turn a blind eye to, or even in some ways support, the growth of this um, Pakistani Taliban and Pakistani al-Qaeda, which the Pakistani military unfortunately sees as a useful hedge against India. So it's a god-awful mess that we're not at all innocent of having helped to make as bad as it is now. But but how does this fit in with Afghanistan? Are Are you saying that the basically what's going on is we're... We're uh, waging a war in Pakistan, and in order to do that, we have to continue fighting in Afghanistan. So we're trying to get the Pakistanis to wage their own war in Pakistan. But we're trying to convince the Pakistani government that it's in its interest to turn against Pakistani Taliban and Pakistani al-Qaeda rather than, as has been the case in the past, kind of have a deal with them that says, if you more or less leave Islamabad alone, we'll leave you alone, whatever you're doing in the border regions, um, which clearly, you know, by the way, includes um, training extremists who then go off and, and do things in other, in other places. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not a cost-free problem to, to us. But uh, the U.S. can't, nobody thinks it's a good idea for the U.S. to have more troops in Pakistan, for the U.S. to be more actively involved in the fight in Pakistan. And so therefore, we're largely limited to what we can convince the Pakistani government to do. Now, having said that, the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan is incredibly porous. You know, it's a it's a it's an impassable mountain region. So, therefore, you if the situation is such that folks can establish themselves and do whatever they like on the Afghan side of the border, that makes things even harder for the Pakistani military. Conversely, if you could start to do more to deny that area, of Afghanistan to the Taliban, that would put yet more pressure on the folks inside Pakistan, making it easier for the Pakistani military to control the problem. Yeah, up till 2011. There, because there doesn't seem to be any, any, nobody seems to think the U.S. can just, you know, stay there forever. It's too expensive. So it's just a gamble, isn't it, that somehow in the next two years, Afghanistan would become... This seems inconceivable to me that Afghanistan would get its act together sufficiently that it could control its border, so that the Taliban fighting in um, 
Pakistan wouldn't be able to have a refuge in this impassable mountain terrain? Actually, I think the best case that people in the administration think is not that sort of the whole of Afghanistan will be magically um, well-controlled and administered by 2011, but that some of the areas which weren't problems before but have, frankly, become security problems over the last couple of years, the situation can be reversed there so that you don't need... um, You won't need so many forces in the north and east, and you can start pulling troops out of those areas, and the government will be able to establish its writ better in those areas, and that you'll still have, for some period of time going into the future, a fairly significant presence in the south along, you know, in the the areas that are are ethnically Pashtun, that are um, Taliban strongholds, and that are closer to the border with, with Pakistan. So, you know, there's a pretty clear expectation that the in 2011, they'll start looking for places to draw down, but that it'll be conditions-based region by region and district by district, and that the places you'll be withdrawing from first won't be those areas that are closer to Pakistan. So what did you think of the uh, of the Nobel Prize speech? Um, so I was um, reminded when you made your comments of, of a line that, uh, that Strobe Talbot used to use when I was working with him at the State Department, um, growing out of his years in journalism, and um, when somebody would complain that something in a draft was cliched, he'd say, well, it may be a cliche, but it's the right cliche. <laughs> and um, what I actually really appreciated about the Nobel speech was that it was an effort to to string together in a coherent way um, a number of, of things that this administration clearly thinks that maybe not every administration has thought in the past or wanted to be held to. Um, and that it was an effort to actually engage um, on a level of intellect as opposed to pure pure power politics. Um, something that I think hasn't been sufficiently appreciated about it is what an intellectual challenge to the Europeans it was. Um, and I actually think Obama hasn't gotten nearly enough credit for going to Oslo and saying, okay, Europeans, you know, you gave me this prize. You really embarrassed me. Frankly, I would have yes. been, been just as happy if you hadn't done this. Yeah. But you did it, and so you want me to be your house. You want me to be your house, your house pet. But you know, here's my view of the world, and you don't have a coherent response to my view of the world. So I'm not going to challenge you to come up with one. And I thought there were several places in the speech where, you know, he said things like, "In some countries around the, in some countries, there's a reflexive opposition to any kind of war." And I thought the words "in Europe" had probably been in an earlier draft and were taken right. out. Right. So, so I thought um, he actually deserved a lot of credit for um, engaging sort of the, the folks who appoint themselves the, the, right-minded, um, the right-minded arbiters of thought on these issues, on, you know, really taking them on on their own terms, which I liked. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you. I actually agree with that point. That, although uh, I, I've personally experienced this a lot in talking to Europeans, but, I, but it, it, you don't really hear a government saying, saying this. So... Uh, it is a, it is kind of subtle. Um, I don't think the governments ever come out and say, you know, there should never be under any war under any circumstances. Well, but I think you have a lot of governments saying we can't um, give you more troops in Afghanistan because our publics wouldn't stand for it, for example. And so you right. have a lot of governments that are that are they say, oh, well, we understand, but they're very happy to hide behind that. So I, I you know, I, I think mm-hmm. that was what that grew out of. The other the other um, point that I think you know, bears, bears mentioning is, is that, and this also I think has been a little bit underappreciated, although Doyle McManus wrote it up yesterday and I was very jealous that uh, the problem with actually running a nonprofit is that I hadn't had time to do this myself, but mm-hmm. that it was, you know, there's a traditional sort of complaint that gets made, particularly about democratic administrations, that they don't have, that they don't have a worldview, that they don't have a, a theory um, and I think you have to look at that speech and say, okay, you know, this is this is Obama's worldview. This is this is what they think is their concept that links together everything that they're doing. And you can like it, you can not like it, you can quibble with how well they're actually implementing some pieces of it. But there you have a pretty coherent world um, blueprint for why they've done what they've done, why they haven't done what they haven't done. But I, I think it's the same view as every president has more or less articulated. You know, when you say he doesn't talk about power politics, but that's true for every president. No president says, 
Well, you know, we're the United States. We're going to do whatever we want, um, and act. And we're going to act in the national interest. Not even now. This, this is what people thought the Bush administration was doing. But of course, the Bush administration spoke in universalistic terms um, about spreading democracy and you know making everybody better off everywhere in the world. This this speech seemed to me to reflect pretty much uh, American foreign policy. Uh, I would say uh, uh, since World War Two. No, World War Two. The Cold War was different, but of course he, you know, he, he endorsed the whole Cold, Cold War approach of, of, of containment. Uh, he, he celebrated that as, as a success. And then what's left? The idea, you know, people don't traditionally talk, talk in, in the United States in terms of just war and unjust war, but the way that uh, Obama cashed it out is very much consistent with U.S. policy, which is to act in self-defense and against threats. Uh, Against uh, you know threats threats to our threats to our security. Well, I would draw. I would just start with two distinctions um, that may be may be subtle, but that I think are really important. And first of all, it's not every U.S. president. In fact, it's not most U.S. presidents. It's not most U.S. political power centers who are willing to acknowledge that there's even a question that that any you know that the sort of the default position and certainly the Bush administration position was that any war America gets into is a just war and so no, just that's not true um, but he, that's not true that's tell that's me tell true. me a war that the US has been in that the Bush administration would have thought was unjust you mean um, oh you mean of the ones that have already exi- that have already taken or tell place. tell me a war that anyone suggested no I mean and so just saying okay this is a question that's open for discussion is something that is quite, is a departure from sort of the American political canon and then second um, the the critical distinction between how the Bush administration talked about doing good for the world and how the Obama administration talks about doing good for the world, if you want to put it that way, was the Bush administration's point of view was we know what the world needs. We don't need to go through the UN. We don't need to waste our time in 192 nation games of chicken. Um, We can unilaterally do this stuff and it will be good for all of you, and uh, we will talk about it in glowing terms, how it will be good for you, and we'll convince enough well, of you. They, to they never it. said that, Heather. Th- that's your gloss on, on what you think they really believed, but that's not what they said. And, in fact, they used international organizations and uh, and you know tried to act multilaterally and, and so forth. And Obama well, Eric, and that's speech, not what the people... That's, I mean, you may, you may believe that, and, I, and I'll grant you that they genuinely believe that they tried to use them, but... The people in the, this is actually the point I was getting to. The people in the organ, in the international institutions did not believe that the Bush administration made a good faith effort to engage with them. The Obama administration has gone out of its way and has even gone out of its way to point out pretty aggressively, and I'll, I'll take you back to the UN speech in September, to mm-hmm. say, okay, guys, we're going to sit down and we're going to sit through your 192 member games of chicken, even if, you know, frankly, we could do this a lot better, just 17 of us someplace else. So we're going to sit here, we're going to talk about things that are important to you, we're going to talk about nuclear disarmament. Um, you know, we're going to we're going to talk about adaptation. And in return, guys, what are you going to give us? How are you going to step up to the plate on things that we care about? And so, the willingness Nothing. to right. to not just say we're checking our box for multilateralism, but say we're checking your box for multilateralism. That's a major a major attitudinal difference in how Americans approach the world. And how I'm sorry, and how Americans change the, the how approach? Americans approach that the idea that. That just we you mean Obama is rejecting the traditional American view? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think the traditional America—it's it, complicated. The 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 Cold War was very much a, you know a multilateral effort, um, right? That's what Truman did. He built all of these multilateral institutions. Yeah. The uh, the and the Cold War remained a multilateral effort throughout. Now, of course, the Vietnam War was was unpopular, but right. They made mistakes as well, or sometimes they felt like they had to act uh, without as much uh, international support as they wanted. And then over the years during the Cold War, what they discovered was that in these international institutions, as more countries became independent that had formerly been uh, uh, colonies, the U.S. was constantly outvoted. So over time, the U.S. became less enthusiastic about many of the institutions that it created than it had before. But it continued to use these institutions when it was in the when it was in its interest, and 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 there was always this sort of you know either or. So the first Bush uh, gets UN authorization uh, to uh, um, defend uh, Kuwait against Iraq, 
but he was going to act uh, even if the UN didn't go through. And the second Bush wanted UN authorization, but he was going to act if the UN didn't co come through, and of course it didn't come through. Now, is I mean, Obama... There's also a, a difference mm -hmm. in the, the quality of policy between between the two. But, but Eric, it's interesting because what you describe as, you know, over time, um, the other countries found they could outvote the U.S., and so the U.S. got less interested, I was actually going to frame in a different way and say that the big difference since the end of the Cold War, and especially the, the big difference to 50 years ago, is that the U.S. doesn't enjoy the degree of monopoly on military and economic power that it did 50 years ago. So the game the game looks different, and a, a smart president, you know, frankly, a smart president of either political party, um, I just think there are, there are fewer structural impediments to a Democrat actually being smart in this way right now. I hope, I hope that'll change at, at some point in the future. Looks around and says, okay, actually, my ability to act unilaterally is a little is a little different than it used to be 50 years ago in some respects. Certainly, I, I, there are lots of military things that we can do that no one can stop us from doing. But, you know, economically, we're quite constrained. Um, and so, therefore, I have, to, I have to be clever about how I can get the rest of the world to do what I want again. And, and that, you know, again, is a fairly... It's less, it's less I think, a, a brilliant intellectual departure on Obama's part than it is... A, a wise recognition of the reality that we're now that we're now in. Well, I, I think you're drawing too much of a contrast with uh, Bush. I think you're being a little bit unfair to Bush. But even if I'm wrong about that, and it's probably not worth arguing about Bush since he's gone. Mm -hmm. But um, but if you take the whole arc of American uh, foreign policy over 50 years, a period during which the U.S. steadily declined uh, economically as a relative matter. But had this, but there is this funny uh, period which increasingly looks temporary. The period from 1990 to 2000, where the U.S. suddenly was preeminent again, in a way that it hadn't been in, in uh, you know 40 years, because of course uh, the Soviet Union was now gone. And during the 90s, so during the 90s, the U.S. under Clinton, the U.S. in a way. You know, I think Clinton, Clinton and Obama, and the first Bush and Reagan and Nixon, also a person who Obama reminds me of. Not, not of course, the Watergate Nixon, but the foreign policy Nixon. All of these guys were trying to use international institutions in, in roughly the same way, and they would recognize the limits that uh, foreign countries and international institutions put on put on American uh, American policy. And even Bush, the second Bush, did as well. It's just that his actions, and I think you're right about this, I mean, his actions were uh, were less consistent with the rhetoric. That is, he, he was more aggressive than uh, other presidents have, have been. But in terms of laying out a, uh, a, a vision, uh, I, I take your points, you know, <laughs> there was only, there was very little he could do but, you know, if the Europeans really, if the Norwegians really expected him to come and say, you know, Gandhi, pacifism, America's bad, you know, of course, that was a ridiculous expectation. He couldn't possibly do that. And, uh, and I think he did the best he could with the, given the embarrassing situation that he had been put in. But, um, but, uh, but, but and, and, you know, in terms of, he did as best as he could. So I'm not disappointed in the sense that he, that he screwed up. I just think, this is this was a pretty uh, banal uh, a banal speech, but you know politicians have to give banal speeches. Maybe Strobe Talbot is right about that. Yeah, and I actually, I mean, and just then we should we should wrap up. But mm -hmm. um, but I disagree in that actually most I don't know most public speaking, even most of what we think of as great public speaking, is actually um, delivering the right the right sentiment that's just a couple of steps ahead of conventional wisdom at the right moment. Um, you, you think this was ahead of conventional wisdom? I do, because I think conventional... I mean, I was struck as you were sort of summing up your, your arc of American foreign policy after the la of, of the last 50 years of how much... Um, how out of tune with that our public dialogue is. And so I think there are actually lots of things that... Um, Someone who you know who sort of looks at the arc of this from a from a historic perspective sees as as just incredibly cliched, that is actually quite new and surprising and different to to um, to folks who've just been sort of fed on a steady diet of, of popular media commentary mm -hmm. over the last eight years. But um, I apologize, I, I have to jump and go back to okay. my day job. But um, right. Eric, it's it's been great to 
great to talk to you and um, have a have a not overly global warming influenced holiday season there in okay. Chicago. Okay. Likewise, Heather. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.